It's Sunday, April 15th, 2018, and this is the Product Mentor Talk. Today, we're joined by one of our mentors, Alberto Simon, head of product over at Payability. And he's going to be leading a talk today on designing and planning to test a new idea, product, or feature. Um, so be, let me just briefly explain the format for those of you who might be just joining us right now. The people you can't see along the bottom of your screen are mentors and mentees from the Product Mentor Program. Uh, these are people who get paired up at all different stages in their career with mentors uh, who are experts in the fields of product management uh, to help make better product managers, better products, and better you know product decisions along the way. Um, and um, let me just, uh, and so if you're joining us, you're either joining us through the productmentor.com slash live or the YouTube channel, just jump in at any time, post your question to the chat window, and I'll get it along, fed along to our mentor. Um, and uh, let me just quickly go around the room with introductions. I'll tell everyone a little bit more, and then we'll get started. Um, let's start with Stephen. All right. Uh, so, hi, everyone. I'm a product manager at Tailwind, and I'm based in New York. And then I'm a mentee for Kyle Wendling, who works at Foursquare. Excellent. Hannah. Hi, my name is Hannah. I am a product mentee um, at a B2B2C company. Esley. Hey, I'm Esley Savannis. I am a mentee. My mentor is Andrew, and I work at a company called MBO Partners in Washington, D.C. Excellent. Ellie? Hi, I'm from San Francisco, and I work at a, uh, a company called Franklin Energy. All right, uh, let's go over to Anthony. Hey guys, my name is Anthony Lazarus. I am a mentee and I work at a company called Sit On It, which is a office furniture manufacturer. Outstanding. Uh, Andrew. I'm Andrew Shu. I'm a product manager here in New York and I work with a company called Vega Factor, where we help companies build um, high performing cultures and better habits. Um, mentor to Esley. Great, and Alberto, just a quick intro. Uh, I'm Alberto Simon, I'm based out of New York. I'm a mentor and I work at a company that advances uh, funds for small businesses named Payability. Excellent, and I am Jeremy Horn, AKA the product guy, and I'll be moderating here today. Um, so as you have questions, thoughts, or curiosities you wish to post or share, uh, post them to our live chat on YouTube. Um, or if you're watching us on the productmentor.com slash live along the bottom of your screen, right below the video, you will find a chat window, a chat screen where you can post uh, any of your questions there. If they are topical, I will jump in as quickly as I can, interrupt Alberto and make him answer your question. Um, if uh, they're a little bit off topic, a little bit more generic, product management, the questions about life, whatever, um, uh, I will still pass those along to Alberto to answer for you, uh, but I will wait till the end of the uh, talk for those types of questions. Uh, but with all of that said, let's not wait any longer. Let's have Alberto uh, talk to us about designing and planning to test a new idea, product, or feature. Alberto, take it away. Hey guys, uh, thanks for the time and opportunity. This is my first uh, mentor program participation and I'm enjoying it. Um, and I'm glad to get to network with a lot of you guys and gals. Uh, yeah, so my talk is about one of the most common things that come up for product managers, whether you're new to product management or a senior leader in product, um, which is, you know, kind of how do you take the best approach to building out uh, the first version of something? How do you take an idea and make it into like the first product version that we can kind of then proceed on. So my, my focus for my talk is that. And you know, over the last five years, I've been working on a variety of startups. Some haven't really worked out, some have worked out. So I've really kind of uh, you know self um, tried out a lot of these strategies. And um, I'm a big proponent of efficiency and trying to get things done in the best way. So that's what my, my talk's gonna be about. And you know, feel free to jump in with any questions on any examples I provide. Um, for my talk, so let's uh, let's get going. Um, so you know, as I said, so this is kind of uh, the title of my slide. Um, a little bit about me. So I've been doing product management for over ten years. Uh, the majority of it being in um, online advertising tech, but I've also worked in finance, health, um, and have built a couple of social uh, mobile apps. 
Uh, I've done, I've had a lot of good luck to have led a lot of products from that idea phase into the actual, you know, selling it uh, part. Um, most recently, I've worked at Payability for about four years, and it's a company that advances uh, payments to help cash flow for small businesses, mostly Amazon sellers. Um, this has become really big in the last few years. Um, we're now at 35 plus employees. Uh, we're profitable the last you know, six months or so, and we're looking to raise a Series A. Uh, in addition, I'm also working on a, a art investment platform named Masterworks, uh, where you can buy fractional ownership uh, in high-end art. Uh, this is something we started a little late last year, and we're looking to launch kind of our first version this year. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm a strong advocate for process that increases efficiency um, and helps you as a product person add value to the company, no matter what stage, what, you know, what success level they've had up to that point. Um, and I, you know, that's what I kind of uh, really enjoy about product. Uh, so yeah, so this is kind of a, a framework that I share with a, a lot of people that I talk to in, in any capacity, but it's kind of been the framework I've used in the last, you know, 10 years maybe um, in some way or, or shape to kind of structure the way that I tackle things, right? And it starts kind of at the top where it's, you know, making sure that the product feature is defined well enough for people to be able to sign off. And this is a key component um, of any, any, pro any product. Um, implementing the process that makes sense for that product, uh, that team um, at the right time. Uh, the ability to measure progress, obviously, by um, building it correctly and then being able to see how it's progressing and how it's going along. Uh, delivering, ultimately, which is executing, which is probably one of the most important parts, as always, um, but things to keep out there. And the last part, which is more about testing and refining, which is kind of that cycle back into the, the execution part. Now, I made a slide specifically talking about the assumptions that I'm making prior to any building happening on a product because I think these are really key and I think this is actually where a lot of them do not work, um, do not happen and, they, and then the product doesn't go well. And you know, these are components that as a product manager, you should definitely be involved in. And if you aren't, you should actually probably ask why you weren't involved in these parts. Um, so it includes things like researching the actual product that you're trying to build, um, finding some way to kind of uh, at least have a hypothesis that is testable and measurable so later when something is rolled out, you actually have a way to know if it's successful or not. Um, stakeholders that are in the, in, the, in the approval process have given this approval and this doesn't include just your boss or just like your direct uh, salesperson or something. It has to be kind of a consensus. And of course, that so you have some ability to have some team um, assist you in doing that. Um, now, uh, on this slide, I'll give you some personal examples of my uh, learnings from mistakes that we've made in our product. Uh, there was a couple of times where, you know, after getting a lot of feedback for our internal salespeople that they needed a better way to create reports and, and all these things, also from customer service, we went ahead and built like a self-serve report builder. And as it turns out, obviously, you know, that, that feature is one, a lot more complicated to build than it might appear. But two, it actually is definitely, was definitely not the highest value add that we could add. And variety of stakeholders, including our CEO or you know, our marketing person, you know, definitely asked us like why that feature was built um, before you know, 15 others that we had that would probably be better. In addition, a lot of the people that said they wanted that feature really never use it, right? So in, in reality, a lot of times you have to confirm that when somebody asks for something, they truly need it or they're telling you um, the real problem that you can then solve with the appropriate feature. Um, so that's a, that's a great example of we spent, you know, minimum a couple of months on a feature uh, involving all of our developers and things like that, when in reality, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a relevant feature. It, it's still to this day, I, I don't think anybody's using it because it's not, it's not really needed. Um, the next part, I think once you have, let's say you have a, a good idea that everybody kind of feels great about, is taking this part where, this is kind of the non-fun part of uh, being a product manager, I think, uh, personally speaking, as well as many people that I tell um, this is a part that they have to do is, hey, one, you have to actually, you know, prepare a document that every team member can actually understand and, and sign off on. And I think that's actually more challenging than it seems. It can't be too technical. It can't be not enough technical details on there. Um, it can include, 
you know, workflows, it can include diagrams, it can include mockups. It just really depends. Um, and in addition, once you have anything of the sort, you also want to kind of take into account, you know, this process of paring it down to have only the most critical features that are needed for version one. Um, also accounting for things like, hey, if I want to build Instagram, one of the biggest parts there would be accounting for the architecture needs for that, like how many developers am I going to is, is this going to require? How much upkeep, how much cost on that? That's part of kind of what you have to do as a product person, or at least make sure that you involve the right people to get that um, outlined correctly. Um, and, you know, the hardest part is probably the one it, that lets you know, like, hey, look, we have at least ran some kind of test or ads or anything like that to let me know that customers actually want the product I'm trying to build. And a good example for payability for us was, you know, we, we thought that people would want a certain feature where the very next day after their sales on Amazon, they could get that money. And so we actually, in order to test that, that desired need for that feature, we ran an ad campaign where we essentially said, hey, we have a beta feature coming up soon. Sign up now to pre-enroll. Um, in reality, we really hadn't built a feature, but that did give us a good sense of like, oh no, like people really, really want this. And it's become essentially our best feature that we have and the one that generates the most income for us. Um, but it required us to kind of, you know, set ourselves up to find that out before we spent, you know, three, four months building it. Um, these are key components here that I've learned in the last five years because I've definitely made this mistake, which is a product that it, you know you try to narrow down the features. It still has to be viable, which is a really difficult line, right? So like you can narrow it to like the most simple features, but if it doesn't actually solve anybody's problem because you narrow, you filtered out too many of the features, that's not really going to be a good product, and you can spend then still you know a year or two years or whatever funding allows you to spend. And really, you kind of never had a viable product to really test and, and progress on. Um, getting second opinions also on things like architecture is super important. And a lot of times, product people are told we don't have time for that. We just got to get going. We got to get to the development part. Um, but you know, I think it's really critical uh, things to do that. Doing uh, multiple passes at cutting unnecessary features is also one of the difficult things to promote as a product person, especially if you're not maybe the leader in that team. But I think it's really critical because given a couple of days to think about it, a lot of stakeholders actually will, will not even remember some of the features they had asked for originally. So it's, it's critical that you say as a, as a product person, hey, let's make sure that these are still totally needed before you actually proceed. Um, and you know the last one I personally use the good effect is, you know, given enough time, people can come up with new features as well. So therefore, you want to kind of time box the way that you say, hey, we want to solve this problem, and we have X amount of time to actually define uh, this this product, so you don't overdo it. Um, the second part, let's uh, after this that I've used is this process implementation, right? So. Um, I try to stay away from the word process just because lately it's become kind of like a bad word. So people are afraid of the word process when they think of agile and you know all these scrum methods. And it's uh, definitely something that I want to implement, but you know I just call it like my my whip. You you kind of don't have to use the word. Um, so what I do is I kind of have these tools that I traditionally use to you know, write stories or you know, estimate things, and whether it's Scrum or Kanban, depending on what kind of thing it is. Um, I think that the key thing there is not necessarily the tools you use, but you know, how you um, empower people and have them be accountable um, and make sure that everybody adheres to the process that you set. Um, you set regular meetings, uh, you stick to them. You have to be the promoter of this process and make sure that people um, see you as an example so they don't feel like, oh, you just put that in place to, to you know, make sure that they're working um, because that's not the, the process you want. Um, I think these are more like warnings that I've used for myself and uh, our other teams, which is don't let the process kind of become the reason um, to, to do the work, right? So a lot of the times the process can be flexible depending on your team makeup, depending on the phase of your product, depending on how much time you have. Um, it should allow you to kind of deliver 
things on time, but not be the reason that you know you'd spend so much time in meetings. Uh, I often hear from product people like, "Oh, I was stuck in meetings for the whole day." All these things are examples of usually how a process has become uh, the product, or almost as important as the product itself. Um, as I mentioned before, you must be an exemplary example, like exemplary of that process. Uh, I see too many times that people that want to, you know, say that somebody should do a process, they don't follow it themselves, and then of course the team loses confidence in you. And as a product person, that's probably the the last thing you want. Um, I would say also this next one is is something I see a lot, and I used to do it myself, which is not be inflexible with the tools you choose. You know, let people uh, chime in. So if they want to use Jira and they don't like uh, Pivotal Tracker. That doesn't really matter. As a as a product person, you should be able to kind of work with any of these things and make it make it happen. Um, and then the last one is just, hey, if something doesn't go right, as often happens in, in any project, uh, don't don't blame any anyone around. Don't don't like um, say it was due to the process or anything like that. Like, be sure to you know not cause any loss of confidence in the team by by use it or in the process by kind of saying, oh, we should switch to something completely different. I've seen that happen a lot of times where we're like, oh, no, we should have done this. And the process would have helped fix it, but that's not usually true. Um, the next phase is you know, how to measure progress as you're actually studying the, the process of building out a feature and or a product. Um, and so this also includes things like, you taking the time to find the right tools to help you collaborate on ideas, clarify requirements, communication, things like that. Um, and also take the time to kind of narrow down those, those uh, tools that you end up using just so it can be simple and you know have a single point of thing. So for example, many people end up using you know too many to-do to -do list type apps, right? So they want to use Asana, and then they use Pivotal, and then they use Google Docs. Um, I think that becomes super unnecessary, and it becomes just more confusing and less likely for you to be able to know what's going on. Um, number four is really important, and has been for me, which is take the time to actually present, uh, you know, sell the tools to the team and explain to them why, why you think they make sense, and, you know, ask for any suggestions they may have. but. Take the time to kind of like let them know like there's a reason why I'm using these. You know, some of my favorites I think are pretty much pretty common. Um, but you know, Google Docs, Slack, like all these things, like Pivotal Tracker for me is like a good balance of enough features to track progress and create stories, but not having too much going on, such as sometimes Jira can feel a little bit excessive in, in what it offers. And it's hard for, for many different teams to use it. Um, for design, I'm a huge fan of like you know iterating on visuals and making sure that people see stuff. So Zeppelin and Envision have really provided these tools uh, nowadays that, that are really key to, to making sure stakeholders can visualize things. Um, I think a lot of times they don't have the time to read every single doc or every single story that you design. So it's important to give them a way to gauge how the experience is going to be for the user. Um, and let them kind of um, figure uh, take it on that. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to jump in here. We've got some questions, a bunch of questions, all from Steven. So let me uh, find him there. There you go. Steven, ask your questions. Hi, Alberto. Uh, so you mentioned uh, way back when on like one of the earlier slides on product spec, um, and you mentioned uh, you should include evidence that customers want this. And I assume that the product spec is the point at which you've sort of defined a problem, you think there is like some sort of set of features that can help it, and now you're getting people to buy in that you should build this. Um, so I wanted to understand like how far do you get in this like evidence building portion? Um, I think that- Alberto, uh, Alberto, don't forget to uh, exit your slides, we can't see you. Oh, I can see him. Uh, Alberto? I think you can, I think I am exited, I don't know if something's froze or? No, it's good now. Okay. All right, great. Uh, yeah, so um, good question on that. So I think for me, that phase includes being able to kind of show the, the possible reasons that you want to build it out. So it could include, for example, ad results that you did or customer surveys um, and things like that. So for me, 
uh, that's where a lot of the work that is done is actually done by the product person. So at that point, before I really involve like developers or maybe a designer could be involved, but I really try to avoid that. So I've, I've really kind of practiced being able to show visuals to the stakeholders um, as part of my process there so we can evaluate a bunch of different kind of features that we may want to build. Um, so I really, uh, if, if at all possible, I try to not involve any development team at that point and kind of just, you know, do it myself or maybe use a marketing person to help me with some visuals. But really it's more about sales, um, you know, marketing and like whatever ways I find to say like, here's some clear indications that this feature makes sense to build. Okay, got it, thanks. Cool, um, cool. Keep the questions coming in to uh, the product mentor.com slash live as well as the YouTube chat section. And as they come in, I will pass them along to Alberto. Alberto, back to you. All right. All right, cool. So, you know, now that we've kind of, uh, touching up on this slide, now that you've kind of decided a little bit about like the tools you're gonna use, uh, the different process that you're gonna implement depending on what the feature is, I think that the uh, the first, uh, the most important part of this is being able to deliver efficiently and you know iteratively on the first versions of products. I think seeing the cadence happen, whether it's weekly sprints or whatever you chose, is super um, encouraging to the to the entire organization, the entire team uh, members, especially as you know nowadays everybody works super hard and long hours to like get things done. Um, but it's really key to kind of uh, show that progress so people can, you know, have those short-term goals as well as that uh, not lose sight of the, the bigger goal. Um, and so for me, what's worked really well for version ones is keeping the iterations really short. So uh, this, of course, doesn't mean that oh, I can't do any real features and I don't do features that are complex, but it does mean that it, it forces not only me as a product person to better define features, um, but it does force, uh, you know, the team to kind of really try to evaluate a, a good way to estimate the feature uh, complexity um, and you know puts a lot of accountability on the team to, to deliver. Um, it also allows you to kind of do one of the most common things that happen, which is things kind of change slightly in direction as, as people find out more. Maybe there's some market research going on at the same time that says maybe we don't want to do certain things. Um, so I think for me, keeping that iteration um, length small avoids an issue of like, hey, what happened in this month? And then nothing nothing really got going. Um, it also avoids the typical scenario of, you know, um, if I get given a, not a month to do something, somehow I find a way for it to take a month, which I think a lot of people are naturally, you know, they, they fall into. Uh, and I'm not, you know, it's just kind of like a human trait. Um, the second one I think is really important because I hear too many people have the mentality of like, just ship it, like, oh, I just want to do all these things really fast. I want everything um, right away. Um, but I think that, you know, as a product manager to earn kind of that trust um, from your team, you really kind of want to show them that you've, you've worked to set some realistic deadlines that make sense because otherwise it just seems like you're one of these people that are like, oh yeah, um, by being mean to the team or just saying a bunch of unrealistic things that will get done a lot faster. Um, so I've worked myself to avoid coming off as a, as a as kind of out of touch with like how complex uh, software can be and, you know, all the things that come up and all the bugs and stuff that can happen. So I try to set realistic deadlines that are aggressive still because obviously a lot of this time the team understands that there, there might be limited time, limited money, limited resources to do things and we got to get going. But they don't want to make it seem like, oh yeah, let's launch something that's gonna, you know, it normally takes a month, but let's do it in two days. Like that's just not, you know, that's kind of a myth that people want to believe can happen. Um, um, this is uh, the next phase, which is, you know, assuming you get the the first version done. I think what helps for my teams has been kind of letting it be known, like, hey, even though the first version uh, feature might be done. It's not like it needs to be truly done because that's not really possible. So that gives people a little bit of comfort to know like, okay, um, you know, the first version had this feature and it works this way, but it's okay. So it's not, a, if it's missing the five other things that could be done on it, it's okay. Um, and 
you know, having a good plan, um, and this has helped me in my career, uh, the fact that I had a lot of QA experience, like the team trusts that, hey, this guy knows how to actually test and he's going to find the bugs and then we can iteratively, iteratively fix the issues and make it better. Um, number two is really key as well. So I think we've all had stakeholders or teams of people that give feedback that give you a lot of feedback when something is rolled out. And a lot of the time it's actually based on the fact that it might be new or different than they're used to. So it's super important to kind of take the time to filter out if the feedback itself indicates that you might have actually misunderstood the, the need and that's like a, something bigger to kind of address the next time. Um, because a lot of the initial feedback will start to kind of fade away if you, you know, one, you take the time to um, do a demo, do a training to the different teams to show them how the new feature, one, how it's better and how it's improved or different, and two, how it actually works. So it minimizes their lack of understanding and then them giving you feedback, trying to revert it back to whatever they're comfortable with. Um, and number three goes kind of along with that number one, which is, you know, you have to kind of uh, be that guy that, that champions this test repeat, you know, improve um, uh, with mentality in, at your company and on your teams because this actually, you know, creates a good mindset for how to build features. And one thing I will note though, that it's harder than it seems, right? Because a lot of the times people say, oh, well, this feature didn't work out, but we learned something from it. But in reality, when I ask them what exactly we learned, it's really hard to quantify. So um, this kind of, um, this mentality is, is, is critical for companies that are trying to maximize the, the little funding they may have, um, you know, truly building features in a way that They'll, they'll be able to know like, hey, you know, this resulted in this KPI going up and, you know, being able to, to see that happen and then learning from that and taking it forward. Um, and so that, that's why I mentioned the, the KPI there as well. Um, but yes. So one of the examples, sorry, I forgot to mention, one of the examples here is, you know, for, for us that didn't really work well because of this, this feature was, we were trying to find a better way to qualify our potential clients. So we kind of came up with this feature to automatically qualify them using a slew of like a checklist type approach. Uh, the issue was that that, that checklist was kind of only um, defined by like a single team member. And that team member obviously is a, a contributor that didn't have the, the same um, high level thinking of saying like, oh, how do we actually verify that this is uh, repeatable for every customer. So what we ended up doing, um, you know, was a feature that took, you know, obviously usually a little bit more than people think. And then we started to really kind of see that some of the different client personas were different. So the, the process needed to be slightly different. And therefore it was hard to kind of even repeat it for the different uh, customers, which ended up kind of adding scope to the feature itself that you know, ended up taking probably over three months. Uh, to be honest, even to this day, we're still fixing some of the, the things there. Um, and so it was a clear, clear example of, you know, we, we kind of built out a feature because it sounded great on paper for one, one or two use cases, but we didn't really kind of um, take it through its paces of really defining if it was repeatable and how it applied to different customers. Um, so that's, that's something that, that happened to us not too not so long ago, actually, still. So, um, you know, I'm always trying to improve kind of how we do things there. Um, yeah, so kind of in conclusion here, this, this last slide is kind of a, a reiteration of the things that I think, you know, make a, a good product manager, um, at least, you know, for, for myself and my experience here and seeing other working with others. And, you know, I wanted to kind of reiterate these points because uh, they're that critical. So number one being that, again, you're an example of the things that you preach. I mean, I think that that's a common thing, but it's, it's difficult to actually do a lot of times. So you want to make sure that you're aware of, you know, if you tell someone that, you know, that, that you should do a certain process, that you do it yourself. Um, number two, which I think is a, happens to a, a lot of us, and sometimes we can cut up too much with those, but 
you have to be that person that is able to kind of take other tasks that other people may not really know how to do, want to do, and just volunteer and do it. I think that earns you quite a bit of um, good grace from your team, and they know that you're willing to kind of take on those things that um, nobody else might be able to do. And even if you don't know how to do them, I think that with all the resources out there, you'll be able to find it, right? So um, it doesn't really matter what it is. I can usually find out how somebody already did it like uh, before me. And uh, we, just had a we just had another question just come in from Ami Jape, I think, if I'm saying your last name correctly. Uh, it's a long one, so just bear with me as I as I work on reading it and zooming yeah. in so I can read it. Um, what are some of the challenges that you have faced in the process of prioritizing and narrowing features when your stakeholders are not sure of the functionality features they need? Can you share an example? Yeah, sure. So one of the challenges that has happened to, to me in the last, you know, especially at these startups, is that some of the features start to become for existing clients. And those are hard to quantify versus ones that can create new um, revenue. So as uh, many of you have worked at startups, startups are kind of like very keenly focused on new, ge new revenue generating um, uh, features. So a lot of times the challenge becomes truly measuring how much um, improving the existing client experience uh, and or internal experience to deal with the current clients is going to help long term um, versus you know just focusing on getting acquiring new ones. I think that the you know for payability as an example, the best approach that we've taken is that look you know at the at the end of the day, the current clients, um, a lot of the clients, the new clients we get, talk to the clients that we already have. So even though it may not generate direct revenue by making the current clients happier, we found that you know by doing like a quick survey of you know our new clients and understanding if they were referred or if somebody had mentioned to them payability, how did they find out about it? We did. Uh, we were able to confirm that for our business of payability, a um, good review by another person is a really key component for a decision making to join payability and start using it because it, one, it costs money, two, it involves money, it involves their, money, their payments. Um, so that helped us kind of be able to kind of, uh, what's it called, rank some of those features that are sometimes hard to quantify from a value perspective above the other ones. So that's kind of one of the examples of, you know, it, it really kind of depends on the business you're running because to a certain extent, some of that is not as important, right? So if you're running a B2B, um, one, that, that's not quite as important. I don't really go and ask six other clients of some product before I pick it. Um, it tends to be more straightforward of like, offers X features, they work well, I sign up. Cool, that looks like all the questions we have right now. Um, so uh, definitely a very special thank you to our speaker, Alberto Simon, uh, for today's discussion, designing and planning to test a new idea, product and feature. Uh, head of product over at Payability. And also, as always, the presentation will be posted to our SlideShare channel. And also a big thank you from me, Jeremy Horn, the product guy, and everyone else who joined us today in the Product Mentor. And don't forget, if you're interested in being a product mentor, we're always looking for product mentors all around the world. Like today's speaker, Alberto Simon, the product people of all sorts, all types, all levels. Uh, please visit theproductmentor.com and sign up today. And also, if you're looking to fill a new product job with a great product person, visit our very own free-for-all job board at theproductjobs.com. And with all that said, thank you guys, and I'll see you guys all next time. Bye.